like to welcome you all to our service this morning and just at the commencement of our time together let's all bow our heads and see God's face let's fill our hearts in his presence uh, just as we come before him <coughs> Father in heaven we thank you for the privilege that we have of meeting together in your house again today we thank you just for this song of praise that has come before us just now. We pray that as we come and worship your holy name, come and praise and worship and adoration of a thrice holy God. Lord, we thank you for your blessing upon us in the week that's passed up in God. We thank you for your hand of protection. And Lord, as we look into the future in your world, we pray that as this new week dawns upon us, Lord, that you'll help us to live lives that will bring glory and honour to your name. We remember uh, just our coming together and as we come with the end of your word, we pray for your servant as he opens up your word this morning. We pray that we'll hear your voice speaking of each one of our hearts and lives as we meet today. We remember those of our number who today are not able to meet with us, those who are joining us online uh, at home and those who are listening in, in the hall, we pray that you'll bless them to as we worship together and praise. We remember those who today uh, are unwell and we pray for your healing in their lives, your healing touch. And again, we remember today those who mourn, we pray your blessing upon them in these difficult days. So Lord, bless our time together today. Glorify your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this stage, I'd like to make the necessary announcements. First of all, I'll give you all a very warm welcome, a special word of welcome to our special speaker for today, Pastor Trevor Ramsey, who is uh, president of the Association of Baptist Churches, that uh, has been for the past year. And we're delighted that he's been able to be with us today, and also welcome his wife, uh, Maggie, uh, along today with us. We were chatting just before the service there. Trevor has been here uh, once or twice before, and uh, I was ca quick calculation there, and I hope I don't embarrass him. This is one time that he was here was 33 years ago, so uh, the, uh, if you can remember that back that far, he, he might even tell you what, what, what day that was, but uh, he has been here a number of occasions, and he did a baptismal service in the church here, and was speaking to one person there just before the service again, and he baptized them on that occasion. So uh, Trevor and uh, my delighted to have you with us, and pray that God will bless your time amongst us here today. The announcements uh, for the coming week are as follows. Wednesday at 8, our prayer meeting and Bible study. And this will be followed by a special church members meeting to present the uh, statement of accounts uh, to the members. So please remember that on Wednesday. Prayer meeting first from 8 to 9. And I promise you it will be a short meeting. Uh, just when the accounts will be uh, presented to you. We haven't been able to have an AGM to date because of restrictions, but we do want to get the uh, statements of accounts to you. So that will be done at 9 o'clock after the meeting on Wednesday of this week's special church members meeting. Services, service next Sunday, leisure time at 11. Pastor Alan will be speaking at that service. Good morning. And then we've been asked to mention here that Monday the 10th of May at 7.30, the Baptist Women's Night is online. Uh, it's a free event, ladies, but you need to register online to receive the Zoom details. Uh, if, you want the if you want the details on that, please contact uh, Heather and she'll tell you uh, all the relevant information. And then finally, I want to uh, express her sympathy uh, to Susan on the death of her brother-in-law, uh, William Quigley, who passed away uh, lately and I think the funeral is today. So we'll express our sympathy for Susan and assure the family servant for prayers in these difficult days. Thank you. Thank you, George. Well, boys and girls, great to see you this morning if you're joining online as well. I hope you've got your Bible there with you. Because this morning we're turning to, we continue really the Sunday school lessons and uh, I know you've got your packs 
uh, as you've come in. I hope, I, have, I hope you haven't let all your sweets yet. Uh, maybe you, you've kept some for uh, the rest of the service. Um, but great to have you here this morning. We're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're just going to read a couple of verses, boys and girls, out of 1 Samuel chapter uh, 17. And uh, whenever you look at the picture on the screen, you'll, you'll probably know who it is already about. Anybody think they know who those two people are on the screen? Yes, Hannah? David, that's one. And who's the other one? Goliath. Is that what you were going to say, Bethany? Yep. And I'm saying one or two others maybe had hands up as well. David and Goliath. Now, the story we're looking at today is there's about 50 odd verses. Um, in in 1 Samuel 17 and that's what your questions are going to be about so whenever we finish you keep your Bible open but we're just going to read a few of the verses and then I'll tell you a bit more of the story and what we learn from it and then you can fill in the questions afterwards so we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we're going to read from verse 8 and just down to verse 11 Goliath belonged to an army who were known as the Philistine army and on one side of a valley, if you know what a valley is, maybe you, you, you have two mountains, one over here, one over here, and down in the middle is the valley. But over on one mountain, one side of the valley, was the Philistine army, which Goliath belonged to, and over on the other side was the Israelite army. And we're going to read about the battle that was, well, it hadn't happened but was about to happen between the Israelite army and the Philistine army. And Goliath said he belonged to the Philistines and he was a giant. He was a giant. I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were telling me about somebody in their family who is six foot nine. Now most of us are maybe six foot or less. So six foot nine, they're usually about a head height bigger. But Goliath was even bigger and bigger than that. I think he was over nine feet tall. So he was. So he was really, really tall. Everybody was afraid of him. Wonders if somebody maybe you look up and think, oh, they put fear into me. Well, that's what it was like for the, uh, the, the situation that we have here because the Israelite army were afraid of Goliath. And in verse 8, it says these words, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, that is to the, the soldiers of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, the glass said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. <laughs> wonder, boys and girls, have you ever been terrified? But not only terrified, I wonder, boys and girls, have you ever been like this, where you've, you've been asked by mum or dad to wear something, and you've said, oh no, I can't wear this. Maybe it's a brand new school uniform. Maybe you're going to big school or something, and or, or those who have gone to big school, maybe they've, they've put on their brand new uniform and say, I can't wear this. Or maybe mum or dad, uh, probably mum, she's been out shopping, she's maybe been to Primark or somewhere, and she's thought there's something that would just suit you lovely, and they've brought it home, and you've looked at it and you said, oh no, I'm, I can't wear that. Or maybe you're going somewhere, somewhere special. Maybe you're, you're going to maybe a birthday party or you're going to a friend's or somebody like that. And when you say to mum or to dad, well, if I can't wear my boots, I, I, I ain't going. I wonder if you've ever done that, boys and girls. Or you, you've said, well, if I can't wear my leggings, maybe you're, you said, if I can't wear my legs, you, you, maybe you have a special pair of leggings. And you said, if I can't wear these leggings, well, I, I'm not going. Or maybe you're going to the beach or something. You said, well, if I can't wear my flip-flops. I'm not going. I wonder, boys and girls, have you ever been like that? Or to say, there's particular things you like to wear, particular things, oh, you don't like to wear. And boys and girls, whenever we read on here in this story in 1 Samuel chapter 17, say we're reading about Goliath, and there he is, and he's shouting across to the army of Israel, the soldiers, that's them in, in, in the background, and he's shouting over to, is any man going to come out and fight against me? 
And, and, and if, if somebody comes and fights against me and kills me, well then um, all the Philistine army will be slaves or servants to the Israelites. But if I kill whoever comes to fight, well, all you soldiers in Israel, you're going to be our slaves, our servants. And boys and girls, David, we met last week, and David was anointed to be king of Israel by Samuel. You remember he had the oil put on his hair? We were looking at that last week. And um, it's amazing how many people have got their hair done in the last few days. So it is. I hope he didn't get oil put on it. But boys and girls, he had oil put over it. And it was God saying to David through Samuel, you're going to be king. But he still wasn't king. And boys and girls, what we read is that David had three brothers who were in the Israelite army. And Jesse, his father, said to them, said to David, I want you to take food to your brothers. Here's, here's a parcel of food. You take it to them. And whenever David went there, he saw Goliath. And he not only saw Goliath, and he heard, but he heard Goliath. And he heard Goliath saying, who's going to come and fight me? But none of the Israelite army would. They were all terrified. And David says, well, I go and fight them. His brothers laughed at him. Thought, who? <laughs> well, David, you, you're the youngest in the family. You, how could you go and fight him? But David says, I go and fight him. So they took David to King Saul and they said, Saul, here's this man, here's the man. And he said, he will go and fight Goliath. And whenever, whenever he said that, whenever they took him to him, what we know is that Saul said, well, here's armor for you to wear. The soldiers back then, they had all this armor and the sword and the shield and everything. And boys and girls, whenever David tried it all on, guess what he said? I'm not wearing it. I'm not wearing that. I'm not going to go and fight with all of this armor on me. I don't know why really he, he was like that. I don't know whether he thought maybe it was too big for him. Or maybe he thought it was, doesn't want to show it, too tight on him. Maybe he thought, oh, this will be far. I, I, I wouldn't have any movement. I couldn't be able to fight this man properly. So David says, well, so I'll hear you take it all. All the armor and he handed it all back to him. And David says, I'm going to go out and fight. You don't know why David would do it. said he would do that without all the armor. Because he was trusting completely in God. He knew what God could do. He knew how great God was. And he knew that, that, that Goliath was somebody that didn't love God. David loved God with all of his heart. Goliath didn't. And Goliath wanted the people of God to be killed. And David was defending the people of God. And boys and girls, what he did was, and I, you'll know this, he got a sling. And he got five smooth stones. And then he, as he got them all gathered up and they put them into, he put them into his pouch, he ran towards Goliath. And, and he got one stone out of his pouch, put it into the sling, and you know what he did? He, he, he wound it all up, and out came the stone. Look where it hit Goliath. Right in the center of the forehead. And Goliath fell down and died. And boys and girls, this was a great, great help to the people of God, to the Israelites who followed God. And boys and girls, we can look at all that and think, what does all this mean to me? Well, what we know is that Saul, Saul was absolutely delighted. But Psalm 46 and verse 1, it says these words, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help and trouble. Now, boys and girls, this doesn't teach that you can go into school and throw stones. It doesn't teach that at all. Or at home with your brother or sister or anything like that. It doesn't teach it at all. What it teaches us, boys and girls, is... As we trust in God, he can help us in the difficulties of life. At times we can feel that we're so small. David was so small compared to big Goliath. And it looked as though he was going to be destroyed. David was going to be destroyed. But he trusted in God. And we can look at things in life. And it might be difficult things in life. It might be difficult circumstances in life. And we can look at it and think, how am I going to get through this? Boys and girls, look to God. And look to God through his word. He has given us his word and he has given us prayer to ask God for his help that if we have problems or difficulties, God will help us through those problems. And that's what he wants us to do is to trust in him, to follow him with all of our heart. The Bible also says in all our ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge God. That is, say, God, I need your help. 
I can't do this myself. Will you please help me through the trials and the trouble and the difficulties and the fear that maybe we have in our hearts and he will help us through it all. So next week we'll continue on with another story in the life of David. And um, boys and girls, you have your worksheets there. You can work away at them, fill them in. If you need to ask mum or dad a question about any of the answers, well then you feel free to do that. Don't be worrying about making any noise. I'm going to ask the worship group to come and to sing our second piece uh, for us. And then following this, uh, Trevor is going to come and speak to us. It's just a real joy. Uh, 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 privilege to have Trevor and Maggie with us here today and uh, we look forward to what God will say through his sermon. Thank you. beautiful, beautiful piece. And thank you for your welcome this morning. It's good to be here in Tobermore. Maggie and I are delighted uh, to be here and to share in the service with you uh, this morning. 
My name is Trevor Ramsey and I have just finished over ten and a half years as pastor of Youth Breda Baptist Church in Belfast. And so my pastor is now Pablo Murphy, that some of you will know because he uh, was inducted there into the pastor just a few weeks ago. So he's my pastor and uh, glad to hand over the um, leadership of the church in Youth Breda to Pablo after all those years and I've been serving in the last 12 months as president of the Association of Baptist Churches in Ireland and a few more weeks uh, to do in that role and so it's great to be able to share with you in Tobermore this morning and also to those of you who are watching online something about the association as George said I did preach here uh, many many years ago 33 years ago it was a very special morning for the church here because it was on that particular morning that Pastor Boggs had passed away into the presence of the Lord. And some of you here will remember him, I'm sure, a legend in this church. And I happened to be the visiting preacher that Sunday morning when the news had just come through that Pastor Boggs had gone to be with Christ. And then as George said, I was here to do a baptism service. So it's good to be back in Tobermore once again. Uh, life has gone in lots of different directions for so many of us in those uh, intervening years and I know that some of you here have just kept on going faithfully in the work of the gospel which is so which is so great let me just introduce to you the work of the association of Baptist churches in Ireland some of you are very familiar with this some of you are perhaps less so and I just want to just take a few minutes to remind you that you're part of a big family of churches you know uh, Tober Ward is just one of 117 churches in our association. Now we're not a denomination, so we don't have hierarchies and we don't have, you know, centralized bodies telling us all what to do. We are a bit like a family. And like all families, you know, there are good days and bad days, there are highs and lows, successes and failures, triumphs and tragedies. There are all sort of, you know, in our family, there can be difficulties at times. And that's what the association is. We're just a family. Of churches 117 churches and we thank God that way back in 1895 yeah, there were those who had the vision to to recognize like-minded churches and to bring us together in the Union the Baptist Union of Ireland and then in the year 2000 we became the Association of Baptist Churches so there's the kind of numbers of people who are worshiping in Baptist churches on a normal Sunday and those who are in the membership of our churches and in, uh, in the year 2000 we became the association uh, one of the stories which i like to share as i go around different churches is the a good news story that i think sometimes we miss and that is if you take those 50 years from 1970 to 2020 those five decades uh, our churches planted or established over 50 churches in ireland north and south it's not a good news story and it's a story we don't often hear about. So either through the work of Baptist Missions or through our existing churches, uh, over 50 churches were planted and established in those five decades. Certainly when we went to Limerick in 1986, I think Alan and Heather Limerick quite well. I think they came on a team from Armagh Baptist. I think that's when the romance may have, may have started. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, that was a way back in the, in the late 80s. When we were in Limerick in the late 80s, um, there were only, I think, 11 Baptist churches in the whole of the Republic of Ireland. Today, there are 27 Baptist churches bearing witness to the gospel. And we just recently welcomed a new church in their association in Black Rock in County Dublin, one of the most expensive places to live in Ireland, a place of affluence, but right in the heart of that is one of your sister churches witnessing for the gospel. And this year, in 2021, there will be two new churches formed, uh, one in Passage West in County Cork and one in Belturbet in County Cavan. It's a lovely new story of what we're doing together in the association of, of Baptist churches. Uh, let me just uh, say a few things there. That, that's quite small, I think, but you can probably read some of the stuff that's on there. That we are a voluntary association, so all of our churches, like yours here, are independent, autonomous. You make your own way through life. You you make your own decisions, and you come up with your own um, strategies for working your way through the, the 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 challenges that we face. And together, what binds us together is our commitment to a common statement of faith, a common 
doctrinal statement that you believe that all your sister churches in the association believe and we work in partnership for the gospel. You see this in the Bible, uh, don't you? You see the, 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 the opportunities for churches to work together, that they weren't just independent, that they were interdependent. They con sometimes conferred together. They sometimes helped each other. They sometimes sent money to one another. They sometimes sent workers to, to one another. And they worked together for the sake of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And you can see that the, 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 the Bible teaches this interdependence of churches as well as independence of churches. Baptist, uh, the Baptist Association is centered upon, a, upon our building there, our Baptist Center in Mora in County Down. And thank you for your support as a church at Tober Moore for the work that we do together. And there are some of the people who are involved in the ministry of the, the association and the work that we do together. Dave Ramsey is our association director. Can I just say that Dave and I are not related as far as we know. He's not my father. No. He's not my son. He's not my brother, he's not my cousin. Sometimes they, people think, oh, Dave Ramsey, Trevor Ramsey must be related. But Dave does a sterling job. He does a fantastic job in just guiding the work of the association. Mervyn Scott, you will know, because Mervyn's on a bundle of energy, isn't he? And promoting the work of Baptist missions. Matthew Campbell does a great job in the work of Baptist youth. Gail Curry in the work of Baptist women. And then the work that we do in our college. Our college is so important as we train future pastors and workers for the work of gospel ministry under the leadership of Edward Newark and also Davey Ellison, who is our training uh, director. I always feel a little bit intimidated by those guys because they're so theologically sharp, aren't they? But thank the Lord we've got people in our college here preparing the next generation uh, very well. Can I just quickly then, just as I close, just finally remind you of the work of Baptist Missions? I want to encourage you to pray for Baptist missions and proclaiming Christ and planting churches. Together we can do more than we can do on our own. Uh, because of the commitment of Baptist missions to do the work in Spain, we see that you and Tomer Moore have got missionaries today in Spain through your partnership with other churches. And so those who go from the association through Baptist missions to serve the Lord in Spain are really your missionaries that you need to be praying for and supporting. And likewise in France, and I hope you know some of the names of the people, I don't have time this morning to bring those to you, but some of the names of the folks who serve the Lord in France through Baptist missions. It's remarkable. These are needy countries, Spain and France, countries that the gospel the, has never really taken hold in those countries. The Reformation passed them by. And yet here we are as an association of churches sending missionaries to places like Spain and France. Just right now there's a young couple and they uh, are from County Dublin and their names are David and Hannah Sandal. And David lives in the family farmhouse and that farm has been in his family for generations. And Yet God has laid his, life, his hand upon David and his young wife Hannah and their three young children to go and serve the Lord in France. And so right now they're in the business, as he told me just recently, of decluttering the family farmhouse that's been in the family for generations. You can imagine what it was like. Each generation just walked out and left it to the next generation with all the stuff in it. And so they've got a job to do there. Uh, but God has set, laid his hands upon them and they, with their three young children, will move to the great country of France in just a few weeks' time. And then we think of the work that God is doing in Ireland, north and south, and the church planting since Spain, France, Ireland. And of course, we've got a long-standing partnership with the gospel in Peru. Now, I've never been to Peru. I was supposed to go last November, but coronavirus paid uh, the end of that. But I do know that you, through Tobermore Baptist and through our, our other churches and our association, have supported, prayed for, and encouraged the work of God in Peru. And so I want you to know that. I, I want you, especially for those of you who are younger in this congregation, to know that, to know that being part of this church means that you're part of a wider work of God, even as far as the land of 
uh, Peru. Baptist youth do a great job with teams and camps. Um, working together to transform the next generation. I want to encourage you young people to see some of their online devotions and maybe even this summer get involved in some of the work that Baptist youth are coming to do. Baptist women, we've already heard an announcement this morning about the work of Baptist women and the online night they're going to have on Monday the 10th of May. Can I just say also to you men, this Thursday night I'm hosting a men's night for the men of our association online uh, with Paul Tripp who's going to be talking about leadership in our local church and then with a panel discussion. So if you've got an hour, hour 15 minutes or so on Thursday night at 8 o'clock, log in with me and, uh, and, and be part of that event. It's something that we can do uh, together. And then maybe there's something here today and you're thinking, God's calling you to Christian work. I want you to consider the work of the Baptist College and the work that the college does in preparing and training people for ministry. I, listen, I could talk for a long time. I don't want to talk too much, but I want to give you enough to make you think. And let me just lastly encourage you, if you want to know more about what our churches are doing together, get the Insight magazine and sign up for that. And it's a physical magazine. It's got devotional articles, doctrinal articles from, from some of our pastors and workers and others. And here's a little thing you can do with Insight magazine. You can steal the ideas of what other churches are doing. You read about other churches and what they're doing to reach people with the gospel, and you go, that's a good idea. We're going to steal that idea for Tober more. But that's partnership, isn't it? That's working together and coming together for the sake of the gospel. Now, let me just share with you real quickly a little bit. Alan's just asked me to share about our own personal situation. Um, my first wife, Sheila, went to be with the Lord in uh, 2007. We'd served the Lord in Baptist missions, actually, and then in church planting in Green Island. Uh, and then, latterly, uh, you know, she went to be with the Lord just at, at that time. But uh, thank the Lord, the Lord's given me the wonderful Maggie. I met her uh, way back in 2009. I thought she deserved a good husband. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I'd better marry her in case she found one. And she'd never been married before. The Lord's given me her. We've been so blessed uh, to have each other, I think for the last 10 and a half years in the service of the Lord in Newton Rita. And in a few months time, we're going to be serving the Lord in a completely different context in the land of Spain that I just shared with you. We're actually going to a, a town called Benidorm. Have you ever heard of Benidorm? Put your hand up, right? Now, when you hear the word Benidorm, do you think positively? Put your hand up if you think, no, you don't. No. Because it's associated, isn't it, in culture with stag do's and hen parties and all that sort of stuff. And yet in Benidorm, there's a little opportunity to witness for the gospel. As you can see, it was once a small fishing village. Over 70,000 people lived there now. But there are millions of people pour into that place every year in a normal year. There are 350, 300 skyscrapers, 200 nightclubs and 1,000 bars. It's a place of sin. In fact, it's known as Sin City. And yet there's a little church there called the English Church for English speakers. And that church was established way back in the 1980s. When some people saw the need, as that town started to grow, they saw the need for a Christian witness. And so they planted that little church called the English uh, Church. It's overseen by that trust that you can look up and it, it's it's ministers entirely in english to expats do you know that there are fifty thousand english speakers live along that coast within striking distance of benedorm many of them have run away from something in their past they've gone for reasons of history or they've gone for reasons of health and this church right on the strip in benedorm bears a witness to the gospel of jesus christ uh, with a full church program, with two Sunday services, with a midweek Bible study, a communion service, a coffee morning, and outreach into the local uh, community. You can see some witnessing on the beach there, and some baptisms taking place in the sea. I'm sure you don't do your baptisms in the sea here, but you can do them there. And in God's goodness, I've got an opportunity to go and pastor the church from the 1st of September 2001. And Maggie and I will be involved in evangelism and discipleship and pastoral care, preaching 
I'll be preaching in the church, etc. She'll be looking after the women pastorally and uh, seeking to reach out to the local uh, community. That photograph is maybe a little bit dark, but that's us sitting on a bench overlooking Benidorm. As the sun goes down, this little phrase, Benidorm T.S. for I which means Benidorm is waiting for you. Now, if you'd said to me a year ago when I was pastor in Newton Green Baptist, did you end up in Benidorm? I thought, no, that's never going to happen. Why would you do that, Lord? But you know, when you're a follower of Jesus, you've got to be ready for anything, haven't you? And you've got to be willing to go. And that this small handful of people there um, just try to, 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 to faith, faithfully witness to the gospel. And every Sunday, in normal circumstances, which I hope we're going back to, people will come into that church. And over the years, there's been a steady drip of converts, of people that come to know Jesus. Now, I could talk a lot about that, but I want to get into God's word in a moment. But please do pray for us uh, here in October more occasionally, even in your prayer meeting or in your own personal prayers. Just send a little arrow prayer to heaven, because we're going to need God's help. As Pablo said just a few weeks ago, and he knows, doesn't he, because he went from here to be in Spain as a missionary. Just because it's sunnier doesn't make it easier. And uh, we're seeking before the Lord to see great things happen and for the Holy Spirit to come. Now, in the short time we have left this morning, I just want to take you to talk about the local church. The local church. And let me start by saying this, that everybody has got an opinion about church. Everybody from the secular atheist to the religious person, everyone has got some idea or thought or opinion about church, especially in Northern Ireland, where we've got loads and loads of churches. Some people hate the church, and they've turned against it, and any, any mention of church or Christianity or Christ or the gospel sends them into a lather of, of frenzy. You see that on Facebook, don't you? Other people love the church. They've grown up in it or they've come to love it and they, they've loved the, the gospel and they love the people of God and they love serving and they love ministry and they love going to meetings and hearing God's word. Most people are probably somewhere in between. Maybe you're sort of slightly in between. It's part of your culture to come on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, but you're not really passionate about the local Church. Now, in the Bible, the word church is the word ecclesia. You've heard that. It means a called out one's church is people. It's not a building. And in the Bible, the word ecclesia is used in two different ways. First of all, it refers to the universal church. The church of the, of the people of God. Past, present, and future. The universal church are those who have come to know Jesus Christ, who love him. Some have died and gone to be part of the great congregation in heaven. Others of them you will never meet because they're brothers and sisters in Peru or in Spain. They're brothers and sisters in India or Africa or Asia. You will never meet them physically, but they're part of the universal church. But the other way the word church is used in the Bible is the word is in the context of a local church. Where people gather together, as you do here in Tober War, and you come together and you know the people in the seats and the pews in front and behind you. And you share each other's lives. And when people come together, they come together for the purpose of wife. And there is nothing like a local church. It is a place of worship, instruction, fellowship and evangelism. We come together as the people of God for worship. And haven't we missed public worship in the last year? And it's a great privilege, you know, to be gathering together for worship. I don't know about you, but my heart was lifted just hearing the ladies sing those two pieces this morning. Yes, I could hear that maybe on, on YouTube or something, but just being here, it's something about that, isn't there? And there's something powerful when the people of God, all the ages, all backgrounds, all status, different personalities, different income levels, just gather together in the one place and sing their hearts out. And sing the praise of Almighty God. The local church is a place of instruction. It's, it's wonderful to sit with our open Bibles. And hear the pastor or trained people. Teach us from the word of God. 
And here the eternal word of God taught in a relevant way. We've already had that this morning as Pastor Alan took us to 1 Samuel 17 and taught the boys and girls the eternal truths from the story of David and Goliath. Not a legend, a true story, but lessons for life. The, they don't get that anywhere else except the local church. Yes, you can go on to YouTube and you can hear the best preachers in all over the world, but God just wants you to gather together with brothers and sisters in a local context and learn instruction. Then the local church is a great place for fellowship. That's the F of the word life. The Bible describes it as koinonia, sharing together, sharing our lives together, sharing our hopes and dreams, our our sadnesses together. And how do we miss that? Yes, you can do you can do that online to a certain degree. But you know what you can't be? You can't be on a Sunday morning when you're coming into church Sunday Sunday. How are you? How's it been this week? How's your sister up and praying for her? Oh, weren't you going for an operation soon? Are you worried about that? You cannot beat that. That's Christian fellowship. And so for those who are tempted to stay away, that's what you're going to miss out on. And the local church is a place for evangelism. When together, Tobermore Baptist Church, the people here bear witness to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in their community. And then sometimes we do that personally, don't we? When we talk to people in our workplaces and they say to us, do you go to that church in Main Street there in Tobermore? What's that like? What do you do that for? Is that not a bit outdated? You get an opportunity to tell them. Well, actually, I do it not because I'm a religious person, but because I'm a redeemed person. I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. And then sometimes we just do corporate stuff, don't we? We get together as a church and we go, we're going to have a mission or we're going to do walk for life or we're going to have a children's outreach. And together we pool our skills and our talents and our abilities and together we achieve more because the local church is a great place for worship, instruction, fellowship and evangelism. And we have been through this horrible pandemic the last 12 months. And we have lost so much and we've missed out on so much. And well done to everybody who does stuff online and produces services online. And I am in awe of the technical ability of people who can do that. But at the end of the day, you cannot be just coming together for worship, instruction, fellowship and evangelism. And as we emerge from the pandemic, I want to encourage you to do that and to follow the Lord's will in that. Let me take you to Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse 41. What a key verse. You know that Acts 2 is the, really the foundation of the church there. And it's the day of Pentecost and Peter preaches this marvelous message. And they come and they say, what must we, you know, what should we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And then you have this in verse 41 of 2, Acts 2. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now notice how in this verse, I've just highlighted for you and capitalized the verbs in that verse. Accepted, baptized, added. This is Acts chapter 2. It's the foundation of the church. And so we're, we're being told here a principle that's really important. And that is that these are the principles, if you like, that govern the local church. We are to be people who preach a message that others and invite others to accept that message. And I wonder, have you accepted the message? I wonder, have you been saved? Are you born again? Are you a real Christian? It's very easy, you know, to slip in and out of a church and never really accept the message. Never really embrace that message for yourself. I talked to so many people and they said, well, my granddad's a great Christian. I go, no, I'm not talking about your granddad, I'm talking about you. Oh, but my mom and dad, they were great Christians. They, but I'm not talking about, I'm talking about you. Have you accepted the message? When I was 17 years of age, I slipped into a church and I sat down at right angles, sort of over here to the preacher where there were some pews. And that's where a lot of the 17, 18, 19 year olds sat, the young people sat. And because I sat there where they sat, and because they were followers of Jesus, and because I was sitting with them, they thought I was a follower of Jesus. 
But it wasn't. But God started to work in my life over a period of weeks and weeks and weeks as I heard the preacher preach the message until one Sunday night that was on the 8th of September it was just at the end of the summer they turned to me and they said Trevor we're going out to preach in the open air do you want to come with us? I said yeah I'll do that and as I was preaching standing with them as they were singing with their guitar I realised I had no right to be there I was an imposter I, was a I hadn't accepted the message and that night I got into a friend's car and they led me to Jesus Christ when you, in the local church, we encourage people to accept the message. Notice this, that what happened to them when they accepted the message? They were baptized. They were baptized by immersion in water because the word baptizo in the New Testament always means, always means plunge, submerge, then were immersed. And so that's what happened to them. They went under the waters of baptism. They died to their selves. They rose again to newness of life. And their baptism marked them out as followers of Jesus. And then it says they were added to their number. I, I love this idea, you know, that they knew how many there were, about 3,000. That's quite a number, isn't it? And there must have been one of their number there, I, I don't know, you know, maybe somebody who loves this sort of stuff, with a, with a clipboard, or the equivalent of that, kind of ticking them off, you know, counting them. There's always people who love clipboards, isn't there? And spreadsheets and, and doing that sort of stuff. Somebody must have been counting. But here's the point. After they accepted the message, after they were baptized, they joined together to the church. They, they counted themselves one of a bigger number of others. They got added to the church. That's why I just think coming to Christ is fundamental. Then obeying the Lord in baptism is so important, actually. And then just identifying with your local church. And saying, these people are my people. They're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Somebody said, if you find a perfect church, don't ever join it. Because you'll only spoil it when you join it. it. Won't be perfect anymore. None of us are perfect. But there's a wonderful thing about the Lord and his local church. They accepted. They were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Somebody wrote a book about the local church and he gave it this title, Cinderella with Amnesia. What an interesting title. You know the story of Cinderella, she went from rags to riches. How she was just the, 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 the little girl cleaning and serving everybody else and all of a sudden she, she shall go to the ball. She shall go to the ball, Cinderella. She ended up in the ball in the arms of the prince until midnight struck. And then she had to be back home. But somebody wrote this book and they said the church is a bit like Cinderella with amnesia. We have gone to the ball, but we've forgotten where we come from. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, what a wonderful thing it is to know Christ. What a wonderful thing it is to be saved and to be in his kingdom. You should never despise or count it a mean or unimportant thing to be part of their local church. Let me just quickly then point you to this verse in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. I love this verse. This is one of my favourite verses in the whole of the New Testament. It says, His intent was that not through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. If you know your Bible, you'll know that in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's talking about God's plan for the Gentiles. That was quite new. Because even many of the early apostles thought the gospel was only for those from a Jewish background. But Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And in chapter 3, he said, God's got a plan for the Gentiles. By the way, that's you and me. And he said, they're going to be heirs together, members together, and sharers together with Israel in this great hope. And here were the Gentiles and the Jews, and, and at times they had... They had they had lots of enmity and lots of animosity towards each other. And Paul says, the Jew cannot rejoice in his goodness and the Gentile cannot rejoice in his goodness. And he begins to tell us that the Jew has to come to the cross and the Gentile has to come to the cross. And together they're reconciled through the cross. And that's the church. 
or whoever you are, whatever background you come from, you come to the cross and you meet others at the cross and together you're part of this body of believers in Jesus Christ and you cannot boast in your background. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, God's purpose for the church is that the very uh, rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms should look at all of this from a distance and go, wow, look at the manifold wisdom of God in doing that. That word manifold earth really means the multi-coloured wisdom of God. And Paul says, they, they, they look at this and they are in amazement at God's amazing plan, a remarkable plan, to bring together Gentiles and Jews in one body, which we call the church. And through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is seen. Now, God demonstrates his wisdom to us in lots of ways. In creation, how great the heart went through the woods and forest glades, I wonder, and see the trees and feel the gentle breeze. How great the heart. Creation demonstrates the wisdom of God. The Ten Commandments demonstrate the wisdom of God. Our conscience demonstrates the wisdom of God. The crib where the incarnate Son of God was born demonstrates the wisdom of God. The cross demonstrates the wisdom of God. His second coming demonstrates the wisdom of God. But here in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says the church demonstrates the manifold wisdom of God. So let me finish by, re by reading you this quote. It's a wonderful quote. The church is a multicultural a multinational, multicultural community like a beautiful tapestry. Its members come from a wide range of colourful backgrounds. It's true, isn't it? No other human community resembles it. Its diversity and harmony are unique. God bringing us all together, weaving us together into a marvellous tapestry. So let me just land this by asking you, have you accepted the message? I can ask you that because I don't know most of you. So don't feel in any way that I'm personally getting at you. But if you do feel a little pang of conscience right now, that's the Holy Spirit. Maybe somebody watching online. You've never yet trusted Jesus. Do you know he loves you, he cares for you? Jesus died for you to make you a follower of his. Why not come to him today? And then let Pastor Alan or some of the leaders of this church know you know what, quietly, I've come to Jesus. Maybe you've wandered away, you want to come back. Why don't you pray like this, Lord, I've wandered far away from you, but now I'm coming home. Maybe you've been a believer for some time, never yet gone through the waters of baptism. In the early church, they did it right away, what's keeping you? And they joined the church. Maybe it's time you became part of this church in a formal way and serve the church and serve the Lord by using the unique gifts, talents and abilities that you've given me. Now we hope to do that in Benidorm to serve the Lord there and encourage the, the believers who have made their home there who speak English to serve the Lord in that needy part of the world. But whether it's Benidorm or Tobermore there's nothing like the local church for worship instruction fellowship and evangelism. Let me pray for you and then I think the, the, the girls are going to come and lead us in another song. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for its truths. Thank you for all that we've learned. Write these truths, Lord, wonderfully by your spirit upon our hearts. For Jesus' sake. Amen.
We want to thank Trevor uh, for his message to us this morning, sharing with us of the association, by sharing with us about the local church. We do want to wish Trevor and Maggie every blessing as they go to Spain. Uh, much sunnier, but it doesn't mean it's any easier. And uh, we do pray that the Lord will really bless them. But if the Lord's been speaking to your heart this morning, you want to speak to me, afterwards please do wait behind. Uh, you know the different things that Trevor's been saying. Or you want to speak to Trevor, I'm sure he'll be too glad to speak to you. And uh, do please uh, consider uh, seriously all that's been said this morning. We know where we stand before God in the light of it. And uh, do please uh, deal with it or sort it out today. And uh, be right before God. Let's all pray. Father, we thank you for our time here this morning. The real sense of your presence. Thank you, Father, for all that have joined online, those who are in the hall. And uh, Father, we pray now that you'll bless your word. That, Father, as we would part, take or leave, may, Father, we not just walk away from what we have heard from your word today. But, Lord, that we make sure that our lives are right before you, that we're walking in obedience. And, Lord God, that we're the people that you want us to be in this world. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the local church. Thank you for this local church. And thank you, Father, for all that it stands for as we've been considering this morning, the worship, the instruction, the fellowship, and the evangelism. May we continue in that and continue to do it all to the glory of God. So part us now with your blessing, in your fear, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you again for joining with us. I do remain in your seat until the office bears I give you the instruction uh, to leave. But the Lord bless and do indeed keep safe throughout another week. Thank you. God bless.